Uh, okay, so it's time to start. Uh, good afternoon and thank you all for being present here today and for joining this conversation. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by members of the Motion Project. Motion is a collaboration between the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium and Climate Kick, a member of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Uh, my name is Suzanne. I am the project manager of Motion and will be your host uh, today. Um, so Motion collaborates with a number of sustainability initiatives to develop an innovative methodology that helps its partners to become more transformative and thus contributes to a more sustainable society. Uh, we are accompanied here today by two of these partner projects, SUSMO, a project on shared mobility, and Saturn, a project on urban and rural landscaping, which are both also funded by Climate Kick. Uh, furthermore, the Sustainability Transitions Expert of the Motion Project, Professor Johan Schott, is present today. At the end of this webinar, he will reflect on today's discussion by discussing the role of citizens in moving uh, towards a more sustainable world. Uh, thanks, Johan, uh, for making yourself available to participate. So uh, today we dive into the topic of transitioning into green living. In a few minutes, our partner projects will enter the stage to discuss this topic from the context of their work. Uh, however, we're also very curious about the insights from everyone present today. Therefore, we would like to invite all of you to explore this topic further together with us. During the webinar, the partner projects will ask some questions to you related to the barriers and opportunities for sustainable communities. And your responses to these questions will feed into the discussions. Um, so in order to collect your answers, we will use Mentimeter. Mentimeter is an online polling tool, which we will introduce to you now. So before we can start, we'll do a quick test. Yes, Irene, thanks so much for sharing. Um, we would like to ask all of you to navigate to Mentimeter. Um, as you can see at the top of the slide, Irene's sharing. Uh, we would like you to ask to go to www.menti.com and you can enter the code. And then you should be able to see this question appearing on your screen. And you can do so either in your computer browser or using your uh, smartphone. And we'll wait uh, a minute for everyone to uh, join in. I can see there's the first responses uh, popping up. And I see there's uh, people from a lot of different places from India, France, here in Utrecht, of course, um, Stockholm, Germany. I think, I think a few more people still need to uh, get their Mentimeter set up. I think most of the people are in now. Um, if you have technical questions, uh, please post them uh, in the chats uh, to Irene. Um, and yeah, I think we have 21 of the responses coming in. The panelists probably are not responding. So I think we should be good, uh, good to continue onwards. Uh, that means uh, we're ready to uh, start with the first uh, project. And uh, that is the Saturn project which deals with sustainable systems approaches to the use of urban and rural landscapes. And Anastasia Nicola uh, Logiani and Nick Grayson are here on behalf of the project, and they will introduce themselves and the projects uh, to you now. Uh, so please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Anastasia Nicola Logiani, a landscape architect and also a horticulturist, agriculturist, and working uh, within Birmingham City University and the Saturn Project, looking into how we could uh, design more sustainably um, our future cities or regions, obviously with urban farming and growing that we're discussing today, but as uh, with with other areas uh, such as proper design solutions, benefits, etc. And I'm um, together with uh, our colleague from Birmingham City Council, Nick Grayson. Nick, you want to? Yeah, hello everybody. So my name is Nick Grayson. I'm the Green City Manager at Birmingham City Council in the UK. Uh, and I'm also uh, a senior research fellow at the University of Birmingham, uh, specialising in air quality. Um, but um, our interest uh, in this uh, webinar is is the Saturn project, and we're um, uh, we're focusing on 
a whole a whole uh, series of different uh, case studies and uh, subject matter looking at the connections between people and landscape and the the barriers and one of those that uh, forms a, a central case study for us is urban farming. So thank you, Nick. So we've been asked to discuss about urban farming and ag urban agriculture uh, today, but do we all know what it is? So it could be it called urban agriculture, urban farming or urban gardening in some cases. And it simply is, you know, the process of cultivating, uh, growing, or processing and even sometimes distributing if you if you see it in a more professional way, distributing food in in around urban areas or even peri-urban areas. So we we have in mind uh, we have it in mind as agriculture or farming, but sometimes it also involves um, urban beekeeping, horticulture, agroforestry, or agriculture. And th these are some of the areas that you know we consider when we talk about urban farming. It could be. Um, Usually, you know, the name suggests that it's on developed in urban areas, but sometimes is also in peri-urban areas around our cities or regions, and and this is where it it you know has the potential maybe to grow further. Um, I would ask you to maybe pose the first question we've got for you today while I'm this discussing a little bit about the urban farming um, opportunities we have in Birmingham and the first question is what is your personal level of experience with urban farming so we've got five different um choices for you choices for you never heard of it until now until today heard of it but never seen it uh seen it but didn't use any produce from it bought or use produce and actually growing yourselves and I would say that in Birmingham we have, even though it's maybe considered for some of you with, with a very heavy industrial city, and it is a post-industrial city, um, but we have lots of different activities around urban farming, uh, either in a more personal, so we have a lot of allotments where people could go around and, and uh, grow their own, um, their own farms in backyards, but we also have some more senior uh, let's say, or organized uh, activities like the social farms and gardens and other um, other areas that we could discuss in a bit with, hopefully with, um, with Nick's insights on the city. But I see that loads of you have never heard of seen urban farming, which is interesting to me. Um, so you sorry heard of it but never seen it okay i'm sorry apologies on that so that's that's good so you know what it is probably but you haven't seen it in a more in a, in a professional way or you haven't seen it at all that that's interesting because i think um you know even if you're growing uh, a basil plant or some oregano in your balcony or in your house that could be considered a tiny bit of of urban farming do you agree nick yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's a very very broad topic. Um, the thing that interests me when you're saying about Birmingham being a, um, a post-industrial city is you only have to look back at the uh, early maps uh, of Birmingham uh, when it was forming as a city. It used to be a whole series of villages that have just coalesced really into a city, and until relatively recently, that is within living memory of many of the citizens of Birmingham, there were considerable areas of uh, food growing, market gardening, uh, even farmland within the boundary of the city. So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting phenomena that in this current generation, it's seen as alien or a disconnect. And I think that's what it represents is this disconnect that people have that, that city living is disconnected from nature. And the whole the whole issue of our food and where it comes from um, is, is something that is almost a mystery to people uh, in that um, it's just available prepackaged, um, available through um, uh, the very well established uh, economic networks now through major chain supermarkets and the like. Um, and the idea of actually growing, uh, handling growing food yourself 
um, it is not something that's built into people's psyche. And yet, as I was saying, uh, within living memory of many of the citizens of Birmingham, uh, there were uh, considerable areas of growing. And as a heritage from that, um, the city has over 7,000 uh, um, individual uh, plots available that are city owned that are rented out to residents, making it uh, the UK's uh, biggest uh, public sector offer mm -hmm. and probably uh, sits within any uh, European league tables on that on that basis. And I think it's interesting that while you're talking Nick and explain what it is, we saw some change, we saw more people putting in bought or used produce. And I guess I'm what you're just saying, mm -hmm. it might be suggesting that we don't, you know, what we we, we don't know where it's coming from. Um, and that's why maybe we, we have a big number on seen it, but didn't use any produce because some of us, we might have used it, although we don't know uh, it is from there, I guess, unless you have someone who has an allotment and gives you something or, you know, you, you know, a farmer or a grower yourself. Um, but before I go, before I go to the next question, I would just like to mention one more thing on the people who said heard of it, but never seen it. Because I think when we, even when you see, you know, especially in the peri-urban areas, when you see a small orchard or a, a small area of, of growing um, that could be clustered or considered as urban farming or peri-urban farming, even though it might be used for, a, you know, in a commercial purpose, or it might not be in a big scale to, to sell. So it might not belong to a farmer, but it might be a, a small orchard, uh, you know, that a, a house has. Do, that could be clustered as urban farming. So I, I'm just speculating a little bit here, saying that you might, if you think, you know, in your holidays or, or trips, you might have actually seen some of it, but don't necessarily realize it, it is clustered as, as urban farming. So going on to the second question we've got for you today, it's now that you know a little bit about what it is, um, which benefits, what benefits do you associate with, with urban farming? What do you think is, is going to be good, either in a, on a personal um, response or more in a community kind of, of side? So it could be anything. Community building, okay. That one was quick. <laughs> Cheaper, more regional. So um, we have loads and loads of different uh, things are coming in. I guess I will just pick on on the first of all on the mentality side of thing that th says therapy, more happiness, and this is certainly something we do in Birmingham, don't we, Nick? In terms of using the allotments on that, uh, I think there's um, this is exactly where uh, you expect um, uh, people to. Um, identify what the benefits are on an individual basis. Um, and a lot of those relate to well-being um, and also that um, assurance that you actually know uh, how your food's been handled or treated or whether it's not had chemicals or um, whatever your preferences are. Uh, at least you have uh, safety and security, food security in that uh, amount. You can you can work that through in your own lifestyles, and then there are other comments there around greener cities, uh, which again is is hugely important and links deeply to the ideas of uh, regenerative cities and how they need to respond to the climate and ecological crises. Um, uh, the other the other thing that um, has been borne out through our experience in 2020 is of course the, um, the connection uh, people have, the ability people have to be able to grow their own food in whatever scale has really been uh, a substantial uh, support mechanism through the COVID-19 uh, crisis to date. And um, communities and individuals have fed back very loudly on that. And in fact, uh, there's a call for uh, more possibilities, uh, more land being made available uh, to people, and particularly in 
areas of greatest need where uh, issues of environmental justice don't correlate with the availability of growing areas currently. And that's something we're looking at at a, uh, at a city scale right now. And, and I think just to build on that, what you just said, uh, Nick, together with the question I've seen from the chat that says, does urban farming eliminate supply chain risks in agricultural food systems? Well, it is still developing, but this is maybe one thing we're trying to work out within the Southern project we do Well, Birmingham participates, uh, but also Trento and Gothenburg are um, doing tests and have case studies on that. So what we're trying to see is, um, learn from Gothenburg especially is to develop uh, an urban farming process as a model where you you know it minimizes the any kind of risks um, CO2 emissions transport emissions and all that that has to do with moving the food from one area to the other obviously packaging and and all this that happens in a commercial scale is you know relates with your question there on on um, on supply chain and agricultural food systems, but I would say this is still in progress, I, I, I guess. Um, so just before we, I, I think we've got a bit of time, hopefully to discuss a little bit more on that. So we've talked about the greener cities, the community building, um, but I, I wanna pick up on something that it, it came when I saw it when it came and then it disappeared. I'm not sure if they, oh yeah, there it is. It, it says cheaper. So um, Nick, I don't know, we, we have to discuss on that. Um, and sorry if, you know, if I picked something you, it doesn't sound very popular, but yeah. I'm not sure if it makes it cheaper. We're well, I, I, think, I think we've got a very interesting, uh, we've done a lot of work with um, our, uh, residents who have growing plots in in Birmingham um, and I think there's been a move over the past few years past couple of decades in particular um, and uh, there's a sort of strap line that we're using now where uh, the growing areas are not for growing carrots they're for growing people and and it's it's because um, there was a real emphasis on productivity uh, and maximizing the yield from your land, whereas now people are a lot more appreciative of those community contacts and the much wider benefits beyond the, um, the actual uh, food material itself. Uh, there's biodiversity listed there in, in, those, um, in that word, word cloud. And um, they provide, the allotment areas provide a very important link, uh, buffer sites, uh, connections uh, between sites and across sites. Um, there's there's um, uh, a very important network of associated benefits and it's how do you actually capture those in a value terms, which then uh, it questions that whole thing of should it be braced just on price? Because if you were to cost that out, you would be paying many euros for your um, kilo of carrots, but actually it's much wider than that in terms of the benefits that have been brought to you as the individual, to the community you're in, uh, to the impact you haven't had in terms of those externalities and to the wider city. So there's, there's a different way of looking at those values now, and that's the that's the next step in our chain. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I've been told we don't have so much time, uh, so I'm going to move into the next question, um, which is: What do you think hinders urban farming from becoming more mainstream? And then we have some choices for you as well. Is it the quality of the produce uh, is not good, and there is a risk when eating it? Uh, there is not enough space in a city to grow food, you believe. Public, political sorry, decisions makers don't care about urban farming uh, and don't support it. It's time consuming and not convenient to get produce from urban farms. Big supermarket chains are not interested in produce coming from urban areas and where food is coming from is not an, an important topic for most people. So we, that would be really good to see who, okay. 
So the, 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 there's clothes with, there's not enough space in the city to grow food. Oh no, that's I, changed now. <laughs> I, I think, I think there's, there's, it will be very interesting to see these responses, but I think the, um, the reality is nobody is suggesting that any city could be self-sufficient in food um, because uh, the sheer uh, density of population uh, pretty much precludes that. Um, you might be aware of uh, one of the Chinese cities that's trying to actually achieve as close to that as it can. But um, generally speaking, uh, the fact that we've got post-industrial cities that are already in existence it's very difficult to create enough land uh, for produce to be produced to feed everybody. And really that's a misunderstanding of what it's for. Uh, it's not really about um, that, it's about giving people alternative choice and it's about behavior change because that, if anything's going to uh, drive uh, a positive response to climate change, it has to start with behavior change on an individual basis. And growing, uh, urban food growing is one of those mechanisms uh, that helps to make people stop and think and actually do something that they really feel positive. We've recently had a whole, everywhere has had uh, the uh, sort of school leavers on strike on Fridays following um, uh, Greta Thunberg's uh, ideas uh, and they've been marching through Birmingham and Birmingham has declared a climate emergency pretty much on the back of what they've, uh, what they've come forward. And when those people were asked, what is it that they want to learn about to make the next step in their lives? Loads of those young people said, we don't know how to grow food. And that comes down to a real fundamental question uh, for people about this real urgency to understand their connection with food and nature. And um, that presents a whole new generation of potential people who actually do want to engage in this topic. And it's about behavior change. It's not about um, uh, substituting at this moment in time for the big supermarkets. Thank you very much, Nick. That's very, very useful and, you know, great insights on the city that we didn't know. I think we don't have so much time uh, no. left. <laughs> so, Suzanne, can you help us here? Do you, are we, is that, is that and all? You can have one more minute for some final remarks. Yeah, okay. Um, so I think, I think from what we, you know, if I can try and summarize and then Nick, um, Nick, please add. It would be, I found it interesting that not many people have seen or believed to have seen urban farming on, and some of the perspective or the questions are we had were on commercial. So it's still, you know, there is this um, concept that urban farming is not good enough or big enough for, to support, you know, the food chain, obviously, or commercial regions. And maybe that's, what we have here in the final um, response on the big supermarket chains are not interested in produce coming from urban areas. Personally, I don't think they're not interested. I think there's probably because the way the supermarkets, you know, operate, they need large quantities. And this is still not the case in, in urban areas. However, this is where we are, where we, we're at, what we have to develop, I guess, and we do through the Saturn project, try to commercialize more or put more of the um, gr scale up, let's say, the, the urban farming activity. Is anything else you, yeah, you would like to uh, add? Maybe? Finally, the only thing I'd say is working with Trento and Gothenburg and Birmingham all on this topic, I think it's, it's, it's moving away from big economics and coming back to very local economics. And at that scale, and at that, uh, when you, we frame the argument differently, then there is a sustainable future, most definitely for this whole idea. And if anything, it's going to expand with time. When calculations are real about carbon footprint and carbon calculation, not notional as they are at the moment, then there's going to be a far greater uh, connection made with these types of ideas.
You are on mute, Susanna. Yes, I noticed. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> noticed just in time. So thank you so much to Saturn and Anastasia and Nick for these interesting insights in your work. Uh, we will now move over to the next sustainability initiative. And this is the project on sustainable urban shared mobility, SESMO. Uh, Francesco Guaraldi and Mauro Borioni are here on behalf of the project. And I'd like to hand over uh, to you. Go ahead. Thank you, Suzanne, for this invitation and uh, for all the motion teams. Uh, I'm Francesco Guaraldi. I work for the Energy Agency for Sustainable Development in Modena. And I'm a project partner of uh, SUSMO, that is a project funded by the Climate Kick uh, under the Ecosystem Project and coordinated by Chenex. I'm here today with uh, Mauro Borioni from uh, the uh, province of Bologna, the metropolitan city of Bologna. Uh, Mauro, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. So just, uh, you, you can introduce yourself. And yes, the yes, yes, yes. Um, the, the, the metropolitan city of Bologna is, uh, the, uh, is the, um, the public administration that manages the planning of the um, wider territory uh, of the city of Bologna. So not only the city level, but uh, also the, the first suburb uh, of, uh, of the city. And uh, I'm, I'm here anyway to, to speak about uh, having in mind the, the, the scenario of the city of Bologna. Uh, Bologna has about uh, 400,000 of uh, inhabitant, inhabitants. And in Bologna, we have, um, since two years ago, um, uh, about two years ago, we have three uh, um, services for uh, sharing. Uh, one of bike sharing um, with uh, about 2,500 uh, bicycles and uh, 300 of uh, them are electric bicycles. And uh, two um, car sharing services uh, is, are active in, in Bologna. Uh, the first one is uh, an electric, um, um, use electric vehicles, electric cars, about 280 um, cars, uh, electric cars. And the second one is um, uh, use um, traditional fueled vehicles and uh, has about 150 cars. Perfect. Thank you. Mauro, yes, this is just a very brief introduction about uh, the SUSMO project uh, that, uh, of course, focus on shared electric mobility and with a clear focus on decarbonization. So the, the SUSMO project are trying to develop uh, guidance, training materials that will uh, support uh, uh, the, the municipality and uh, all the change agents uh, that are in the municipality and in the stakeholder that we involve to shift toward a, a sustainable shared mobility solution. So for this, uh, we are working in uh, promoting the capacity building and creating uh, uh, awareness on a uh, few transition pillars that are mostly based on behavioral change, uh, policy procurement and regulation that this is specifically the topic that I'm in charge of private public uh, uh, cooperation and creation of new business model and uh, data and evaluation. So we, we think that all these pillars are uh, and will uh, support the city to, to focus on uh, urban share mobility with uh, the, the scope of uh, decarbonizing the, the transport system at urban level. But I think that uh, maybe we are speaking and giving a lot of assumptions. So uh, the basic idea in this workshop is also to see how confident you are with uh, this uh, new way of personal transport uh, system, personalized transport system. So maybe Suzanne, uh, we can uh, uh, show uh, the first question. Uh, the first question is uh, which uh, mobility solution have you used before? Usually when I, I walk around uh, before the COVID, I was really having my uh, smartphone full of uh, several apps because I really like to, to, to test uh, new, uh, new solution, new services. And so I want really to see how many of you are, are used to, uh, to use a, a shared solution. So I see that uh, <laughs> there are many 
uh, that are pretty uh, comfort with bikes. Uh, and, uh, yes, well and, as, and, and uh, Francisco, regarding bikes, um, uh, in Bologna, um, the, the, the actual service uh, that is running now in Bologna is, uh, is a free flow. But uh, in the past, we had another system based on, uh, I, I, I don't know in English. Uh, Round maybe. trip solution. Yeah, yeah, because uh, um, in, in, in the past uh, system, uh, you could um, take your bike by the rack and you, you, have, you, you had to, to give back uh, the, your bicycle in, in the same rack. And, and, those, and this system was not so, so fitting to the, to, the, to, the required, to the demands of the, of the population. The actual system that is free, a free flow system, of course, is, uh, is better suited for, 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 um, for everyone. Yeah, no, for sure, with uh, the, the innovation of GPS system, the, the free floating became much more popular, despite the fact that uh, uh, these are mm, two solutions that in most cases should be adopted together because they have also different type of target and different type of scope. In this case, I see that, uh, yes, most of uh, the people are pretty familiar with, uh, with bikes, but uh, a pretty high number have also used uh, cars that normally require some, uh, uh, yeah, some more courageous because sometimes we are, we, we find ourselves uh, as in Bologna to drive cars that are electric cars that maybe at the personal level we could not afford. And so this is a nice uh, uh, experience. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, most of uh, you are also using uh, uh, healing services like uh, Huber and uh, Ride uh, Share Demand. I see that uh, still there are not so many that are uh, uh, having used the e-scooter, despite the fact mm -hmm. that uh, in the last few years, and especially in this uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, situation, at least in Italy, we have been uh, flooded <laughs> with e-scooter in our cities. Uh, while I see that uh, there are someone who had used motorbikes that normally uh, yeah, require helmets, and so it may be that uh, they are not so um, uh, easy to, to be used. So there are also two other that... Uh, yes. Uh, uh, this, uh, of course, uh, with uh, the very limited number of choice, uh, I don't know if uh, we want to intend as share mobility solution also public buses <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, in our interpretation, uh, of course, all this uh, shuttle could also be part of uh, uh, shared mobility. We did not have a chance to include all the different systems. So I think uh, these are uh, preferred. And for those who have never used shared mobility, uh, it would be really interesting to see if uh, they are not using it for because they are using uh, uh, yeah, uh, private uh, transit system or because they are using public uh, uh, transit system uh, because uh, this is uh, the very key question that we may okay. also foresee in the next step. What do you think, uh, Mauro? Do you have any other comments about this? Uh, no, yes, it, it would be interesting to know um, the, the two people that never use the shared mobility. But I think that we 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 can go to the to, to the next uh, to the next um, survey. Yeah. Because in we don't have. Okay, so we move to question two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question two is uh, which uh, um, how sus uh, sustainable uh, do you think share mobility solution are? So this uh, is a quick key question because uh, many of you have still in mind uh, the picture of uh, the mountain of bikes in China that has been uh, dismissed uh, all this uh, the problem of uh, uh, having uh, uh, many uh, companies that uh, decided to launch in this uh, market and then uh, they bankrupt. 
So Mauro, what is the experience in Bologna? You are like uh, uh, opening to anyone or you can, can you tell uh, which was the experience? Because I think uh, Bologna is pretty peculiar to compare to other, uh, especially uh, US and other European town. Uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, in, 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 in Bologna, I, I would answer, it depends <laughs> to, this, to this question. Because, uh, um, uh, for example, um, you, you have also to, to manage also the, the, the service and, the, and, and, for example, for bike sharing, you have also to consider the, um, the bicycle when uh, they are, for, for example, da da damaged. Uh, we found uh, many bicycles, for example, uh, without uh, the, um, the pedals and uh, without the, the, the seat and, 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 and so on. And, and some bicycle also, you, you, you can find some bicycle also in the, in the little river that is uh, um, in, in, in the middle of the city. So um, it, it is not so, so easy to, um, to maintain um, a, 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 a Good uh, um, situation for for, for for the for for the for the bicycle in uh, when uh, they they have been used for 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 many for for, for many times and uh, uh, yes and considering considering the car sharing uh, um, the electric car sharing is uh, managed by um, a society that that, that 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 by a company that that is. Uh, um, not not really in public, but, but uh, managed by uh, public uh, administration. So in this case, uh, you can, for example, um, introduce some rules, some uh, some procedures that uh, are um, that are more fitting with the sustainability and uh, the ambiental for, for, from an, an environment point of view. And uh, the other system is managed by an um, only private uh, um, subject. And in this case, uh, it is not so easy to, 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 to introduce some, some um, measure to, to, to in, in, in um, fitting with the sustainability of the uh, environment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I perfectly understand uh, the, that the sustainability should not be focused just on finance, uh, but should also address... Uh, yes, for, from the, a financial uh, point of view, it is not uh, easy also in this case, because, uh, for example, um, I know that uh, for the um, for the bike sharing, the public administration has to uh, fund this service. And uh, I am I'm, I'm speaking about... Uh, um, 400,000 thousands of uh, of uh, uh, euro uh, every year, uh, and you consider that the bicycle are 2,500 uh, of bicycles. So the, the um, in, in the in the case of Bologna, but but I know also in uh, in, in in other cities, uh, um, the, the the public have the the, the city has to. To, to fund this, uh, this, uh, this service. In the case of the car sharing, the situation is different because uh, um, probably um, they, they, the, we are still in, in, in at the starting of the services, so probably uh, the, the, the companies cover the, the, under, um, the under budget, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, in the future they will have to, for example, raise the, 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 the price or, or, or so on, because um, these systems are, are very, are very uh, um, yeah. it's, uh, are very expensive and, uh, and um, not, not, not only to start the system, but uh, mainly to continue the, the, the year by year. The, the, the yeah, also the, the profitability is pretty different, uh, yeah. depending by the, the means uh, of transport and the type of offer uh, it's been uh, provided. So I think, uh, of course, most of you said correctly that uh, uh, it's neither sustainable or unsustainable. Um, uh, but what we hope is to make this uh, extremely sustainable, integrating sharing solution with uh, mobility as a service. So we move to the third question. Time is running. 
So which are the main barriers that prevent you from using shared mobility solution? So uh, we see that there are still uh, many skeptical in uh, society. There are uh, very uh, specific target groups like uh, uh, young mm, populations that are more keen to use uh, uh, compared to uh, older generation, but of course, uh, this depends also by city, by culture. Uh, there are some uh, barriers uh, related to um, uh, access to uh, credit card or uh, mobile phone, but now these are somehow being solved. Uh, and uh, however, there are still other type of barriers that uh, we are trying to collect. So for example, we see that um, uh, in this very first uh, poll, uh, we have uh, uh, the highest uh, number uh, that say that they are not reliable. This of course, uh, uh, it's worth both for round trip, both for free uh, floating solution. So the, the type of number of vehicle or number of uh, bicycle for for habitants, or this is also depend by the fact that uh, shared mobility solution has been introduced to solve the problem of uh, um, a non-constant commuting. Uh, however, there is an usage also by the people who uh, normally commute every day from the morning to the uh, evening. And so there is a problem to reallocate the bike uh, from the main hubs uh, or the car from the main hubs in the morning. And uh, then uh, we're starting to be a bit short on time. So if you could maybe okay. include some uh, final Ma remarks. Mauro, do you have uh, yes. any other concern about this last poll? Yes. Uh, there is uh, two prices pretty. Yes, uh, just, just one word about the price and, and, the, and the experience in Bologna of the uh, bike sharing. Uh, that uh, in the first phase, the bike sharing service was at a very low price and uh, for, for users and uh, and um, the, the the service uh, has uh, had uh, um, an explosion in in his uh, popularity and uh, and the user and number of users then uh, the, the, they decided to uh, increase uh, the, the the price uh, when they introduced also the uh, 300s of electric bicycle and uh, uh, we see that uh, the users have dramatically <laughs> decreased. Probably some a decrease was was um, foreseen, but uh, the, the decreasing has been very, 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 very big. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, just to a very good hint for uh, making a closure of the remarks. So considering yeah. this, uh, uh, especially in a case where you have uh, a single operator uh, for a municipality decision to run a services, the price is really affecting the usage. So still now the shared mobility solution are not uh, part of uh, uh, the public transport system, at least uh, in Italy. And so the big question is if uh, the municipality should sponsor or not this uh, solution. I think that uh, this is a key question, but uh, a very good, uh, answer is in this uh, time where the mass transit system are suffering because we cannot uh, commute or uh, create overcrowded system, share solution may represent uh, uh, again, a potential solution to, to improve people to use other means of transport in their personal mobility. So thank you very much, Su Suzanne. Uh, I hope uh, uh, that somehow we, we try to to collect the, 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 the answer received that we will keep also for our project uh, SUSMO and to share with our project partner. Yes, well. we definitely will. They will be sent out after the, uh, after the events. Uh, so thank you, Mauro and Francesco of the SUSMO project. And now that we have learned a bit more about uh, the experiences of the audience with urban farming and shared sustainability and your experiences uh, there in practice, uh, I would now like to hand over to Professor Johan Schot for his final reflections. And Johan is a professor at the Center for Global Challenges at Utrecht University, and he's the uh, director of the Motion Project. Uh, as one of the founding fathers of the sustainability transitions uh, research field, 
uh, he will um, uh, give some final reflections on the role of citizens uh, in sustainability uh, initiatives. If you have any final remarks or questions at this point, you can post them in the chat and Johan will try to respond to some of them. Johan, please go ahead. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you uh, to all the participants and thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. <clears throat> uh, yes, so uh, I would like to talk about and reflect a bit upon, upon what we've heard. Um, can you, Jenny, can you share screen? Because citizens play a wide range of roles in transitions. Uh, so when we say transitions, we speak about the, the uh, shift from one system to another. So we have a shift from a system dominated by car with a marginal role for public transportation to a system in which uh, mobility as a service has a bigger role. And the other shift we discussed is a shift from agriculture uh, in, in which the consumer has no direct contact with uh, farming or farmers and is supplied by supermarkets to a system in which there's more direct contact. And that is what we call a transition. And in these transitions in the past, uh, there were a range of users and citizens active in a, in a, in, in a wide range of capacities. Well, the first one is producer. So citizens become producers themselves. If you go to the uh, first cars that were introduced in our society, they were built by people. They were building cars themselves. And also some of the uh, companies that offer uh, uh, mobility as a service or for example, uh, shared bikes or shared cars are uh, created by users. It's the same with urban farming. So you can see a, a clear role that a citizen can produce alternatives in a transition. They can start uh, building a, a new path. A second role is they can act as what we call legitimators. Because for alternatives to be successful, like urban farming and also mobility as a service or uh, collective mobility, they need a broader narrative. They need a story which legitimates their presence. And uh, citizens can be narrators of these stories. And this is an important role they have to play. And these stories need to uh, circulate uh, and in addition, they can also play a role as what we call intermediaries. They can try to align all the forces necessary, all the actors necessary to implement a solution. So they can become active in talking to other producers, in talking to city officials, uh, in talking to citizens and become a mobilizing force. Uh, historically, this also has been very important for the introduction of a car in Europe. This was largely due to uh, users lobbying and developing a car infrastructure themselves. Uh, an additional role is the user citizen. Here in this role, the, 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 the user or the citizen can go, for example, to court. So he becomes a social activist who campaigns for an alternative solution. And finally, we have the consumer. And we have heard a lot about the consumer perspective. So people who are using the alternatives. Next slide. If you then look at transition dynamics, you see here three phases. The first phase is when it starts. And uh, a transition often starts in small. We call that in a niche. So that's an alternative practice, which is rather small. And in this phase, often user producers and user legitimators are important. And then when it needs to upscale and expand, other type of users and citizens become important. And finally, at, in the very end phase, we, uh, we have the user uh, consumers who have to switch over to a new 
system or a new practice. Uh, so what we've heard about in the urban farming case and the uh, collective uh, e-mobility cases, uh, I think we are still in a niche phase. So these are small applications uh, and uh, they need to grow. And for growing, there are four processes important. One is the building of these visions. And we have not heard much about that. Uh, but this is very important. We have heard some elements uh, because why would, for example, about urban farming, uh, we heard the story that this is good for people. It will uh, generate human flourishing. Uh, we will develop a new relationship with nature. These are elements of a vision that are very uh, important for uh, alternatives, niches to become successful. The second factor is networking. So uh, to be successful, the actors who are in the niche need to network with other actors to ensure they get broader support. And finally, there's also shielding, which is that the niche needs protection, for example, subsidies, because often these alternative practices are more expensive and they need protection. A fourth one is learning because it's very crucial in what happens in the niche, what people are experiencing. And uh, we've heard about that, about uh, the learning uh, taking place. For example, people learning about how to grow vegetables. This is something we have unlearned in the past and need to relearn. And learning is not only an issue of uh, a rational process, it also incorporates emotions, incorporates feelings, it incorporates values. I've been involved, for example, myself in experiments with electrical vehicles in the 90s, back in the 90s. And a lot of people were arguing that an electrical vehicle is not a real car. Now, this argument is not so much present anymore. But at that point, it was a very uh, important argument. And, they, and, and because what is a real car? A real car is a car with a range. With a, you, know, you, can, you can take it anytime and go anywhere. And you're not limited by its range. Uh, I think that argument has been overcome. Uh, but in the experiment, when we there were thousands of households uh, in France and in Switzerland and the US using these electrical vehicles. And after half a year, they were arguing that in fact, an electrical vehicle is a better car than a gasoline car. And why was it seen as a better car? For example, because it had another smell. They said a gasoline car in fact stinks. An electrical car has, electrical car has a much nicer, smell. So it involves, transitions involve em emotions. And uh, what's very important is practical experience and learning processes. And in these learning processes, it's important that our assumption about what is best is challenged. And uh, so uh, anyone who set up th these experiments should look into this. How can we use them to discuss, for example, the planning of mobility? Uh, because some of these alternatives do have limitations, but they are only limitations when we think in certain ways about mobility. It's the same with uh, urban farming. Uh, when we look at these niches, uh, some people in the niche who operate in the niche sometimes argue we can keep the niche small. So they, are not, they don't want to build it up because then it will commercialize. And it also came through in the discussion about uh, commercial farming. Uh, so, uh, but they can sit next to each other. So they don't have to uh, compete. 
so I think we had two very nice experiments of transition dynamics that are starting to happen. And I'm looking forward to see the development. And I think the motion projects that we discussed can really help to develop them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan, for these final remarks. Um, there are no more questions in the chat as far as I can see. So uh, that means we have come uh, to the end of this event. Uh, I would like to uh, conclude then with one, uh, once again thanking Saturn and Sesmo uh, for participating, especially Anastasia, Nick, Francesco and Mauro, as well as our funder, uh, iClimateKick, and of course Johan for uh, offering these final uh, remarks. Um, and I would also like to briefly mention uh, Jenny Witte, uh, who you haven't seen, but she was the key person uh, behind uh, organizing this whole event, uh, and Irene Vivas de Linda. Uh, who you also haven't seen, but she was uh, our technical uh, facilitator today. So uh, especially to uh, all of these people who made this event possible, digital flowers, uh, applause to all of you. Um, and then finally, I would also like to thank all the participants uh, for being present today. We were glad you were here and shared your insights uh, through Mentimeter and through the chat. Um, we will send out the Mentimeter results as a recording of this webinar. So if you would, um, yeah. And then if you would like to know more about uh, the work in Motion or Sesmo or uh, Saturn, uh, Jenny will now post um, the URLs of the projects in the chat and she will also add these uh, to the email and there's a possibility to sign up uh, for our newsletter. Um, so if there's nothing else uh, to be added by one of the panelists, I uh, think that means we're ready to conclude now. Thank you so much for your participation and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne, for, for your role at share. And goodbye to everyone. Bye bye. Goodbye. <laughs>